why should we improve concrete? Well, concrete is the single most widely used material in the world. Over 8 billion tons are produced annually. That's a lot of concrete. Now, concrete's used for buildings, bridges, roads, and all of these structures that we use every day. So, let's see if we can improve it. Why should concrete's cracks self-heal? Well, we can see here with a man holding another man leaning over an edge trying to repair a crack in concrete that it can be super dangerous to repair. Here we see if we don't repair it, what the repercussions can be. So what do we desire in concrete? Well, first we want it to have um, certain specifications, certain tensile strengths, uh, resistance to wear, um, we want resistance to freezing and thawing, water tightness, etc. In addition to that, we want concrete to be workable so that our ladies and gentlemen laying the concrete down, um, it's easy to mix for them and um, it's easy for them to put it where they want it to go. Lastly, of course, low cost. Um, as one of the cheapest building materials out there, um, we can use it in so many structures at a low budget. So, what is traditional concrete? Traditional concrete is made out of cement, aggregates, and water. So what is cement? Cement is a chemical combination of calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, and other ingredients. So now, what are the aggregates? Aggregates are made up of fine and coarse particles. Some fine aggregates include sand, and coarse aggregates include gravel and crushed stone. So here we have the microstructure of concrete. As we can see, there are aggregates coated in a certain type of paste, which is the cement. And generally, they have a lot of air pockets inside of it due to the uh, nature of the mixing and also the uh, shrinkage of the uh, paste as it starts to cure. And then here we have a gif of a special type of concrete that's made to be porous so that it absorbs water during rainfall so it reduces hydroplaning in cars. So here we have the molecular structure of traditional concrete which is made up of silica, calcium, oxygen, and some water molecules. The calcium generally comes from the limestone that is mixed into the cement and so is silica. And then um, the water is generally mixed so that mixes with a clinker inside of the cement, which is generally gypsum, ferroxide, and different silicas, which starts to heat up and starts to cure the concrete, making it into a paste that eventually hardens and binds the aggregates together. Okay, so now we'll be looking at the performance of traditional concrete. The graph over here on the x-axis has time, and on the y-axis has a hazard function, which is basically the stability of the concrete. As you can see, after each inspection and repair, the hazard function increases until a point where the concrete can no longer be repaired. The graph over here shows uh, time on the x-axis and probability of fracture on the y-axis. As you can see, as the stress on the concrete increases, it has a higher probability of fracturing. So there are four main, um, four main forms of concrete. The first one is ready-mixed concrete, which, it, which makes up of 75% of concrete used daily. They're generally the ones you see inside cement mixers inside the rolling drum because they're already pre-mixed and all I have to do is add water until it's at the right consistency to be poured and compacted. And then number two is precast concrete. It's generally used in factories, used for casting. And then there's cement-based materials, which isn't technically cement, but has many of the same properties as cement. And then there's such as motor and grout and pavements. And number four is new generation products that they mix in different type of aggregates so that the concrete can seem stronger, be more resistant to cracking. One way they make concrete resistant to cracking is by mixing a bunch of fibers. And that's one that's generally been working on. So in mixing um, concrete, you need a good portion of cement and the aggregates because if you have too little cement, then your uh, resulting concrete is too porous as there's not enough paste to coat all the aggregates. So you have a cement that's very easy to, 
that's kind of easy to fracture because not enough paste to hold everything together and it's very porous and very rough. But if you have too much cement, your, your resulting concrete can be very easy to pour. It looks very smooth, but however, it's very uh, prone to freezing damage, freezing and thawing damage, and also um, very easy to crack as well because the cement by itself without aggregates doesn't have enough flaws to prevent cracking. <clears throat> and also, generally, cement need a good um, ratio between the uh, concrete mixture and water as well as water. Um, as water and cement mixed together to form the paste that binds it all together. Generally, high quality concrete actually has a very low water to cement ratio to, to bring down the price and pres to preserve the curing time. But also you need to use enough water to not compromise the uh, stability of the paste as well. Generally, when you mix water in into the uh, concrete mixture, the paste forms the uh, forms a film around the aggregates, and as it starts to dry, it forms nodes from the aggregates and expands outwards until it meets the, the nodes from other aggregates around it. So it, that, and it also dries from outside to inside, generally in Crown Creek, so it forms a very compressed layer. So basically we have this concrete, and we can stick things in the concrete called admixtures. Now these are just additives um, that are used to achieve certain goals with the concrete, such as accelerating admixture and retarding admixture, which changes the amount of time the concrete takes to set. There's also air and training admixture, um, which involves putting air bubbles into the concrete um, so that we have an improved durability, and water reducing admixture, which is used for um, increasing strength and decreasing cost. And now we will talk about another type of admixture, bacteria that can be used to self-heal concrete. Did you know that in the process of making cement, the cement components are heated up to 1,600 degrees Celsius, which is about one third of the sun's temperature. Reinforced concrete is the only building material that is both fire resistant and water resistant. Due to the thermal conductivity of concrete, it can act as a heat shield. Ponziatic concrete is the only type of building structure that can be used underwater. It is generally used to build structures under the ocean. Concrete by far is the best material for road construction. In fact, about 30% of the interstate highways in the United States are built by concrete. Although it is more costly than asphalt, it is more lasting than asphalt. FYI, asphalt is a bismuth tar-like uh, paving material. It's very different from concrete. So, just remember that. Also in Canada, due to uh, concrete, you can add different admixtures to prevent uh, freezing and thawing damage. Concrete is the ideal paving material in Canada. Canada. The first concrete highway was built in 1909. Concrete was a building material used in ancient Rome. Actually, about uh, six months ago, I think, they actually found out the secret formula for Rome's concrete. Instead of normal water, they actually used seawater instead. Although um, the Roman concrete isn't as good as in compressive strength, it is actually more ideal to be built around um, the sea because they withstand the, uh, safe, the salt in the air because salt air generally starts to degrade concrete. World's largest concrete structure is in China. It's 185 meters high, 2,309 meters long. It's the Three Gorges Dam on China's Yangtze River. It is the largest concrete structure built between 1994 and 2006. The dam's hydroelectric station can generate incredible 22,500 megawatts of power. Yep. Its reservoir holds as much water as Lake Superior and is displaced around 100.3 100 100 million people. Near the turn of the millennium, about 4-5% to of the carbon dioxide emissions worldwide were the result of making cement. The goal behind self-healing concrete is to have a material that can respond on its own to damages or cracks. One way that people have been researching lately to do this is by using bacteria that will produce filler material that fills in these cracks. How this works is when you have a crack form, sunlight or water or some other environmental uh, factor will make its way into these cracks. 
Uh, the bacteria will then be activated by this, say activated by the water, and it'll produce a filler material that then will uh, close the crack. We'll first look at one way of synthesizing self-healing concrete. This method is from the first study on bacteria-based self-healing concrete. They first isolate uh, spores and vegetative uh, cells. They then inactivate these cells by heating them to a high temperature. Um, in the study, they then realized that they needed some way to protect these cells while they lay dormant, so they put them inside the pores of a clay, of a clay material. Um, this clay material was then mixed into the rest of the materials that were used to make concrete. Um, so that you ended up having this bacteria-filled clay mixed in with uh, your end product, the end product concrete. The properties of self-healing concrete will depend on the bacteria used in the concrete, as well as the filler material that these bacteria produce. Uh, one other thing to note about the properties is that when the bacteria are housed in the clay, this clay bacteria combined material is going to take up about 20% of the volume. Uh, this will tend to weaken the concrete, um, which will you know, make for a weaker final, uh, final product. Um, one other thing about the properties is that it's uncertain how uh, the concrete will fare in the long term. Um, there hasn't been too much research into the long term effects and so it's unclear whether the bacteria will survive or how this filler material will, will hold up to prolonged exposure to its environment. Now we'll look at the structure of self-healing concrete. On the image on your right, we see uh, two different structural structures that resulted from two different bacterial additives. One is composed of a calcite crystal, and one is composed of a mixed calcite and batterite crystal. It's interesting that the two different bacterial additi additives did create these different structures, which means that the overall material will have different properties based on the additive you choose. In the other image, which is from the original uh, study on uh, bacteria-based self-healing concrete, uh, the structures shown are at the uh, edge of cracks, and kind of one important takeaway from this was that you did not see these structures in the control group, and so these structures kind of show that the uh, bacteria was working, that it was producing these structures to fill in the cracks. So this is kind of some of the early evidence that this technique could hold up. The performance of self-healing concrete is going to depend on, depend on the bacteria you use. Unfortunately, there hasn't been enough research into this area yet to know exactly how it'll play out in a real-world setting, especially in the long term. Um, we know uh, from the results we do have that you know, it can fill in cracks and that it can you know, have a positive impact, at least uh, in these short-term experiments, but it's unclear you know, the exact properties uh, that, that the materials produced by different bacteria will have, as well as how this is going to uh, you know, last in, in a real environment. It's important to think about what materials you're sourcing and how choosing those specific materials are going to affect the world around you. So now we ask the question, what is the future of self-healing concrete? Basically, time is money. So at this point in time, it's too expensive to mass produce self-healing concrete given the fact that traditional concrete is just so cheap. Additionally, there's a lot of research that needs to be done on the long-term effectiveness of self-healing concrete. And what I mean by that is long-term lifetime of bacteria within concrete along with how well the bacteria heals the concrete Self-healing concrete, it's not you, it's me. We just don't have the budget for you at two times the cost of traditional concrete. In addition, we really don't know what's going on with you and we need to do more research to understand. But thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you so much for watching our presentation. We hope you learned a lot about concrete and self-healing concrete and the future of self-healing concrete. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We would also like to thank Prof Dotto for all the support he's given us through this project.